Okay. Uh, so before we begin, uh, William Patterson University Pre President Richard Heldobler wanted to share some introductory words with us, though he could not be here today. So I'm going to share um, his brief recorded remarks at this time. All right, is everyone seeing this, I hope? Hello everyone. I'm so glad you are all here to take part in what's sure to be an engaging and informative event as part of Transgender and Non-Binary Awareness Week at William Patterson University. This is a critical time for today's conversation, and I want to thank Dr. Brandi Scalacci for being here to share her work with the WP community. Across the country, we are seeing a troubling trend of some elected officials and aligned groups targeting trans and non-binary people out of a toxic combination of fear, ignorance, hatred, and political opportunism. As always with the scapegoating of a marginalized people, it begins with attempts to dehumanize them and erase their history. And the quickest path to achieving those nefarious ends is to try and provoke a baseless moral panic of which trans teens are just one of the current targets. According to a 2022 Routers report, the number of teens ages six to 17 who were medically diagnosed with some form of gender dysmorphia in the United States was about 42,000. Of those, fewer than 1,400 or 3.2% took puberty blockers, which are reversible. And of those approximately 42,000 teens, only 282 or 0.66% engaged in any type of surgery. So looking at the data, you begin to understand how this is not about large numbers of people as much as it is about culture wars and divisiveness. Compare these numbers to the 6,000 children in the same age bracket in 2022 who were killed or seriously wounded by gun violence. Always remember that when people focus on small arguments and try to inflate their significance, it usually means that they've conceded the larger point, even if they're not yet willing to admit it or even realize it. And that is this, trans and non-binary people have always been here as Dr. Scalacci's work makes clear, and they will always be here. So we must all be part of the fight that they are waging to be seen and heard, to claim their place in society and to demand their due rights so that we can fully live up to our nation's claim of justice for all. I want to thank Dr. Allison Dobrik for arranging today's event and everyone in the Office of Student Diversity and Inclusion for helping to support it. Thank you and I look forward to continuing to engage you and the rest of our campus community in this important work. Okay, thank you so much, President Heldobler, for those insights and connections to the present day. Now, without further ado, I am honored and delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brandi Scalace. Uh, a little bit about her. She is an author, historian, show host, and editor of BMJ's Medical Humanities Journal. Her recent book, Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher, described by the New York Times as a macabre delight, explores Cold War medicine, bioethics, and transplant science. Her next nonfiction book, The Intermediaries, will tell the forgotten, daring history of the Interwar Institute of Sexology in Berlin, as we will discuss today. Brandy hosts a regular YouTube show called The Peculiar Book Club, which features live stream chats with best-selling authors of unusual nonfiction. She has appeared on Travel Channel's Mystery at the Museum, NPR's Here and Now, and various History Channel documentaries. She has bylines at Wired, Scientific American, Globe and Mail, Wall Street Journal Books, and Medium. Today's event focuses on the forgotten history of the world's first trans clinic with the subject of the talk, how hatred begins. Uh, Dr. Scalacci will present and then we'll be in conversation and there will be time for audience Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Scalacci, for speaking with the William Patterson University community today. 
Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, we are in my library. <laughs> um, so coming to you live from where I host the Peculiar Book Club, which, which is a lot of fun. I, I wanted to talk to you today. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the article that I wrote, which started all of this research that I am doing into the history of trans lives. And that article was specifically about uh, the first center really for LGBTQ rights and also where they practiced some of the first transitional surgeries. And this is really, really important because this was happening. The, the center was operational from 1918 to 1933 when it was shut down by Nazi forces. So on one hand, um, this is that story. On the other hand, this story starts much, much longer ago. And it starts a long time ago because to be honest with you, um, nothing just springs into being all of a sudden. And so the seeds of the fight for LGBTQ rights and the seeds of hatred that ultimately shut it down began in the late 19th century and, and even a little bit earlier than that. So I'm going to start by telling us, uh, telling a little story and that is going to require me to share my screen. So I will disappear for a few minutes, but I will come back. <laughs> um, and this, this is partly about horm the hormone and the gene. And what I what I want us to sort of recognize is that science doesn't really speak for itself. Um, it requires us to speak for it. But this story begins with with learning about the science of small things. So Ernest Starling, he's a professor um, of physiology at the University College of London in the UK, and he first uses the word hormone in 1902, or 1905, sorry. And William Bateson in 1905 coins the term genetics from the word gene. So two different fields of study begin at basically the same time, um, and they rise from this. And so you get genetics and you get endocrinology, but you also get two types of pseudoscience that come out of the same uh, the same discoveries. The early discovery of the hormone starts a kind of quest for endless youth, and the discovery of the gene unfortunately gives rise to eugenics. And so it's really kind of a, an interesting twin birth. We get the gene and the hormone, and that's that's awesome and that's fantastic. And yet, um, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that science will do good things, right? Or that we will do good things with the science that we discover. So. It's important for us to start off talking about roosters and peas. And I know that sounds strange, but some of the science was strange. And uh, Arnold Adolf Berthold, he's one of the first people that I talk about in, in the, the new book that I'm writing. He was really interested in rooster testicles. And that's a strange, special interest, I realized. But he had a reason for this. He wanted to find out how did we, how, how did hormones work? Well, he didn't know what hormones were, but how did we go through puberty, basically? Um, they assumed at the time that your brain was in charge of everything. So top down, very much a kind of uh, God directed, very moral, a lot of focus on, you know, nature versus sin. I mean, it's a big, lots of sin worries in, at this time. And they assumed that your brain basically told the body, it's time to go through puberty now. And then you did, um, which meant they thought the nervous system was in charge, right? But nobody really understood how that worked, and they weren't sure how your other, they knew what glands were, they discovered those, they they knew what testicles were, but they didn't know what they were for, or what they were doing exactly. So he thought, all right, I'm going to figure this out with chickens. So he he takes some young roosters, and he performs some um, testicle swapping. <laughs> uh, what he does is he takes the testicles out of the roosters, and he cuts away all the nerve fibers at the same time when he does this. And some interesting things happened. The birds with no testicles, just they didn't develop into roosters in the normal way. They behaved more like hens. They they didn't chase the hens. They didn't want, they didn't, you know, they didn't really go through puberty in a normal way. Then he thought, well, okay, I'm going to take some of the ones that I've taken out. And I'm going to put them back in the birds, but in a new place. So he decided to insert them into the stomach cavity, which is a strange place to go. Um, and he sewed the birds back up and miraculously they went through rooster puberty. They became roosters. They were lusty and they fought and they chased hens. And he thought, wow, that's amazing. How did this happen if I cut away the nerves? So at the end, he, uh, he performed autopsies on the roosters and he discovered that blood vessels had attached themselves to the replaced testicles, but no nerves, which meant the brain wasn't 
doing it. The brain wasn't sending signals through the nerves. Somehow the messages were coming from the gland itself. And that was the first time that people thought, huh, some kind of chemical messenger is being produced in the blood. And that's neat, but that's not the real exciting part of this. It means that if your brain isn't deciding when you go through puberty, somehow your body actually has a lot of importance to what to what's going on here. Your body can determine things. Your hormones can determine things. Your chemicals in your body can determine things about you. And that meant nature was in charge. And if something's natural, then it can't be sinful. That's going to be important later on. But the thing that happens right after all of this rooster work is that Bertold gets interested in something else and promptly forgets everything, which happens uh, repeatedly in history. So the other thing I want to talk about is peas. Peas were, uh, so basically we didn't know how evolution worked. We weren't very good at figuring out how, we, we believed it. We were like, yes, Darwin, Darwin, smart guy. Um, how did it happen? Nobody was really sure until we started hybridizing peas. And uh, a monk named Mendel, he is the first person who hybridized peas and started realizing, oh, you know, somehow bits of this plant and bits of this plant get combined to become a new plant, a new hybrid version of the parent plant. And his work was forgotten for a long time too. For some reason, this keeps happening in history. People discover interesting things and then go, and don't really do anything with it. But later, this work becomes really important. And William Bateson is the one who says, okay, these pan genes, these, these strange little messages, they must be called, we're going to call them genes. And that's how we get what I call the science of small things. So one of, uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about the science of small things is you have to understand that this is a society that still believes in kind of a top-down order, right? Uh, God over man, king over proletariat, man over woman, right? There's a lot of this kind of um, the great, the greats lead. This was us realizing that the small leads the great. Tiny little bits and pieces of things in your body are responsible for how we become who we are as human beings. And it was a little bit like suddenly nature was telling us that it was proletariat, right? It was about the common. It wasn't about the great. It wasn't about the great chain of being. And I think that that's, um, that's such a wonderful thing. And it's something that we do learn from science. And you think that's that's the way it should be. But you can do different things with that information. Something very small, only seen under a powerful microscope, was basically pulling the strings of human development. Um, you would think then that means some things couldn't be sinful anymore. Because up until this point, everyone assumed if you were homosexual or you were a woman who felt very masculine or anything, that you were choosing to do that. And therefore you were culpable. You were a bad person. You were diseased. They even pathologized it to say, you're diseased. You were, there's something deeply wrong with you. You have chosen sin over you know, the way God de demands the world to be. And there was no argument against that until suddenly we started realizing that genes and hormones were a thing and that it wasn't all about how your mind soul was um, was approaching life. And I think that is that's so important because basically, if you can accept that, then you can realize that you may not be able to help who you are. This is a direct quote from one of Magnus Hirschfeld's patients. So Magnus Hirschfeld begins... Uh, the Institute for Sexology in 1918. But long before that, he establishes a society called, uh, what he's basically trying to fight for the rights of gay people and originally just gay men. So he, he starts off here and he, in his, his circle grows as he learns new things. And he realizes we can't help who we are. Magnus Hirschfeld was a Jewish doctor. He was also a gay man. And he realized that if I can't, I was born this way. If I was born this way, how can this be sinful? How can science lead to justice? So he believed if our genes and hormones are responsible for making us who, the, who we are, then it's nature, not religion. It's evolution and not original sin. And humans as another being among mortal man rather than the apex of the great chain of being. So all of a sudden we were, we were 
together on this, right? Everyone was sort of equal. And he was a very, he was very interested in equality. He also fought, fought for uh, women's rights. And he recognized that love was not a sin. And here's some pictures of some folks. Some of these are transgender people who went through the clinic um, and had either surgeries or sometimes they they were just uh, dressing in the in the fashion that they wanted to be because not everybody chose surgical options. And you know, one of the things that Hirschfeld thought might be important is to recognize that maybe there's not just two sexes. So I, we should talk about sex a little bit because everybody means something different when they say that. Hirschfeld claimed since 1903, this is a long time ago, that the idea of a full man or a full woman, so that's creatures exclusively of a single sex, were imaginary. He's like, they just don't exist. No one is like that. We're all on this huge spectrum and you have bits and pieces of these things that put that are put together to, to make up who you are. He also was following a man named Steinek's work. And Steinek had been, uh, it's a lot of people interested in testicles in this history. Um, he decided to swap around the gonads of guinea pigs. And I actually, I said, I said gonad at a recent talk that I gave and everyone in the audience giggled, but that's actually the official term. <laughs> that's the scientific term for this. Um, so he, he had had guinea pigs and he took the ovaries of one and put them in a born as male guinea pig and then the testicles and they developed crossways. Basically, he created artificial hermaphrodites and he masculinized female guinea pigs and he feminized male guinea pigs. And of course, the, you know, Hirschfeld was like, see, this pr this proves it. This is absolutely going to be proof. But Steinek's decision after seeing that was to decide he could cure homosexuality. Because Steinek was born in a culture bent on re-masculinization. This is Germany, Germany in a time when they were really worried about masculinity. They felt like masculinity was failing and they were becoming feminine. And some of this was a response to women in the workplace. And some of this was a response to World War I. And so basically, he looked at science that showed that masculinization and feminization was spectrum based and fluid and thought to himself, oh, we got to turn men back into manly men. And he literally tried to transplant straight men's testicles into gay men to try and turn them straight. Um, this does not work at any point. <laughs> <laughs> Steinek did it once, claimed it worked, and got a lot of people excited about it. And then there were no other indications anywhere that this was actually a successful thing to do. Um, it's even more interesting to wonder where he got all these straight men's testicles from. Um, you know, I think that's an interesting question for history. But it's important why this focus on masculinity. It's really important to our story. And I feel like um, that can be kind of hard to explain. So I'm going to come back to, <laughs> to, the, to my face. Why masculinity? Why am I, I'm talking about science. I'm talking about the LGBT clinic. Why does masculinity keep popping up in this story? That was a question I had too. What I realized is from the very first where you had someone like Hirschfeld saying, hey, if you are a man and you love another man, or, or even if you have cap um, aspects of your personality that seem culturally feminine, that's fine. That's natural. There's nothing wrong with you. That, it, that it's okay for you to be someone who doesn't fit the typical masculine role. That made him immediately an enemy of many, many people in the German state because they had built up this idea that to be a strong German nation, they should be a nation of war, a nation of violence, a nation that clung to a kind of Greek concept of masculinity, the sort of Trojan kind of, you know, lots of wars and things. Um, yes, there's plenty of homosexuality in Greek culture too. Um, but they they felt that if as long as you were being violently masculine, then things were going to be okay. In fact, there were even gay men at the time, one of them named Hans Bluer, who believed that um, as long as you were violently masculine, you could get away with being gay too, even though it was against the law still in Germany. Paragraph 175 made it illegal. How did this work? Well, because in the culture of Berlin, and I would argue in our own culture, we're seeing it more and more, the cultural capital of being uber-masculine. In fact, they called them the ubermensch, the supermen. 
was considered um, so valuable that it sort of trumped everything else. So at the bottom of a lot of these fears of homosexuality and transgender identity was misogyny, was a deep fear and and um, kind of a connection of, of people saying womanliness was degenerate and therefore anything that was feminine was also degenerate. And this becomes important in a couple of different ways. And you know, one of them, I will take you to a quote. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Hans Bloor, actually, because um, he is also a gay man. And you'd think that he would therefore be on the side of Hirschfeld and the Institute and rights for gay men to be able to love whoever they want and not to be thought of as though they were pathological. But instead, he felt that men were so superior to women that the male could not coexist with the female. And he said, basically, like they should never mix. And this is very Greek, um, that women should only really deal with other women and men and women should only get together to make children. But basically, for all other purposes, they were weak and they were, you know, the, anyone who had a, a mixture of feminine traits inside them which by the way, could mean a whole lot of things, right? Could mean you wanted to, you know, nurture your children, <laughs> um, but they would say that you're being too feminine. You should want war. And they were, they were so pro-war that people actually wrote pamphlets saying the only way to save German men is to send them to war. Um, that turned out to be quite catastrophic for Germany in the first world war when they lost almost an entire generation of young men. But it meant that Hans Bloor, even though he was someone who identified as a gay man, decided that being uber masculine was actually more important than rights for everyone. So he starts off being friends with Hirschfeld and supporting Hirschfeld and the Institute for Sexual Science, and then in the end, turning against him and actually um, turning against Hirschfeld himself. Because one of the things that he suggested is that Jews were too feminine too. So you end up with a really interesting uh, collection of things. Misogyny had become its own kind of homophobia. Anti-Semitism was used as a shield against homosexuality. So for instance, when Hans Bloor was accused of being homosexual, he was like, I'm not homosexual because I'm not Jewish. And he tried to claim that homosexuality was a Jewish thing. And because Hirschfeld was Jewish and also leading the LGBT movement, many people were like, oh, okay, I see. So you had this um, uh, this attack that starts off going against women, spreads to going against homosexuals and transgender people, spreads and goes after Jewishness. And essentially, um, Bloor turned his back on the homosexual emancipation movement and instead championed, and he coined this term, the conservative revolution, which we hear all the time, uh, this idea that we're going to bring things back to the good old days. And there were no good old days. So what I'm trying to suggest is that if you take science, perfectly good science, perfectly good ex, you know, discoveries, and bend them through your own fear and, and you know, um, it, really hatred, this is how things get twisted. So what I began to realize is though you have Hirschfeld opening this institute in uh, a short period of time, opened in 1918, and they did amazing things. They, you know, they operated as a rights organization. They gave people food, clothing, shelter. They protected teenagers and young people when they had nowhere to go. They helped uh, women, they helped trans women transition and they helped trans men transition as well, both surgically and culturally. They even helped some of them financially. It was an amazing place. But the hatred that surrounded it wasn't just because there were homosexuals involved. It, it had to do with this combination of hatred and fear of a society where conservatives wanted to bring back a kind of patriarchal 
um, extremely, like they didn't want women to have rights. Women had been given the vote. They wanted to take it back. There was this, uh, women had been fighting for abortion rights and the uh, the conservatives who were anti-Hirschfeld were also anti-abortion and anti-woman. They didn't want women to have um, any power in the home or be able to work outside of the home. They wanted to go back, way back to the way things had been, you know, in the in the mid 19th century. And that fear, that desire for control over women basically explodes into a purge of the feminine. And that homosexual purge, purge of the feminine is adopted by Adolf Hitler. And the same rhetoric is then used against the Jews. So I have a nice little list here. Women's rights threatened masculinity, according to <laughs> our ubermensch friends. Supposedly feminized men also threatened masculinity because feminization, they believed, would lead to a weak nation and degeneration and however will we ever be respected on the world stage if we don't get to have some wars. Homosexual, transgender, and the disabled were all blamed for degeneration. And you notice how this group just keeps getting bigger, right? It's not like it was women. Now it's now, you know, there's a there's that wonderful quote about they come for other people and eventually they come for you. That's what's happening here. They added disabled people as well, and they decided to build institutions. And by the way, the gas chambers that were later used in the Holocaust were built for the purpose of eradicating disabled children, which is something we don't often talk about. But when Hitler decided to use gas chambers in the Holocaust, those gas chambers already existed and had been used. So the Jews were considered too feminine, and then they were charged with spreading homosexuality. And these were things Hitler himself charged against the Jewish nation. And Hitler considered Hirschfeld to be, in his opinion, and this is a quote, the most dangerous Jew in Germany, because he represented women's rights, gay rights, um, you know, th that this hybrid or this uh, gender spectrum, and he was Jewish, and he used all of that against him. So eugenics and race hygiene become the new science, where you took that information, just like we saw Steinek said, oh, look, <laughs> I've discovered through guinea pigs that gender is fluid. Um, and he immediately turned it towards trying to stamp out homosexuality. You can take perfectly good science and twist it to political ends. And that is the kind of rhetoric we still see today, where people take tiny little slices of information and then use it to further their own ends through fear and irrational, um, a kind of pseudoscience that's still going on today. Science is only as successful as scientific communication, ethics, and human-centered design can make it. And what happened in Germany, and which is so many lessons for us today is they decided that since genetics might determine who you are as a person, since hormones might determine who you are as a person, instead of seeing that and realizing, oh my gosh, what a wonderful diversity of humanity we have. What an amazing collection of, you know, of vastly different human beings. We, we, we're all so different. Isn't it wonderful? Instead, they thought, well, the only thing we can do then is to eliminate those differences from the gene pool and preserve our Aryan, white, cishet, masculine race. And that is how we get to the horrors that come. And it was, it was you know, six million Jews, but also disabled people, transgender people, homosexual people, um, it, the Romani people, uh, anyone that basically didn't fit that narrow definition of what they considered to be worth the lives worth living. And by the way, when they decided who shouldn't live um, with disabilities, they included things like epileptics, criminals, deaf people, um, people they called, quote, feeble minded, which could mean anything. People with eye defects, like just get a pair of glasses, bone deformities, uh, schizophrenia, manic depression, dwarfism, anything that they felt they were like, oh, OK, well, if it's genetic, then we obviously need to get these out of the uh, the gene pool. And Hitler admired this. And by the way, all of that that I just quoted, that comes from Davenport's eugenics. Davenport was right here in the United States. He operated out of Virginia. So when Hitler took this idea forward in Germany, he said only the born weakling would think eugenics was cruel, just to give you a sense of, of how, you know, how unalterably ugly um, these concepts are. 
this picture here, this is the uh, the Nazi youth coming for the Institute. That's the side door of the Institute. They took all the books, they burned them, they hung swastikas all over the El Dorado and other places, 30, 35,000 photographs, 20,000 books, 40,000 case studies, everything they had amassed at the Institute to protect the lives of trans people, of gay people, all of the things they were learning about how to perform uh, vaginoplasties, everything they were learning about how to use hormones to help people transition, everything that they had done burned in giant bonfire on the Orpen plots. Um, streets were hung with spot stickers and you know, people felt cowed and complacent. There was a lot of people who felt like they they didn't do the bad thing, so they weren't responsible for stopping the bad thing. So Hirschfeld was horrified for this. And he said, you know, he thought science would lead to justice, but instead so much of it was overthrown because science, science can't lead to justice. We have to lead science to justice. So one of the things I always tell people is we have the power to not be silent, but social justice has to intersect where we're most human. We have to be the ones to choose the right way to see science, to choose the right way to apply the information and the knowledge that we collect. So in all of so the, the history of the trans clinic, why is it forgotten? Why is it forgotten? Why is it so few people know about it? When most of us have seen pictures of the Nazi book burning, most of us have seen pictures of that bonfire. Think about it. You probably have. You've probably seen black and white photographs. There's even film footage. That picture, that footage is of them burning the Institute's library. We have all actually witnessed the destruction of Hirschfeld's first trans center and surgery clinic. And we don't know it because the Nazis were not just interested in destroying it. They wanted to erase it from history. They didn't want anyone to know that this amazing progressive place once existed, that there was a place where trans masculine and trans feminine people could go and be themselves. In fact, uh, because many of them struggled to get jobs, they tried to do job placement and a lot of them ended up working at the Institute itself, including Dora Richter, who is the main sort of the main, uh, the hero, the main character of my story as I tell it. I think, I suppose I, I want to try and and um, and pull this in for us because I really want to have a larger conversation with all of you and with Dr. Dobrik about it. But the most important thing for us to realize is a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, we were on the cusp of something great, of a recognition that gender was a spectrum, a recognition that you ought to be able to choose who you love and that it shouldn't be penalized in any way. It was tied to a fight for women's right to vote and women's rights over their bodies. We were there a hundred and some years ago. Um, the other thing to remember is that in 1923, exactly 100 years ago, the first tremors of what would become the Nazi organization were felt and were growing. And people then didn't take it very seriously. They thought it can't happen here. So here we are in 2023. In 1923, it begins, the hatred begins to mount and becomes something that threatens everyone. In 1933, the Nazis take over and the Holocaust begins after that. We're in 2023. We don't want to get to a 2033 that is the same. But the power to change that exists, and it resides in all of us, recognizing our history and recognizing that we live in a culture where the seeds of hatred are being planted very, very subtly. And bias and prejudice is something we suck up. We don't mean to, but we pull it into ourselves. And one of the most important things that we can do is to recognize the humanity, the rights, and the personhood of every single person that lives and to step back from our own knee-jerk reactions and take a really look, long, hard look at what history can tell us about how to make a better future. Wow. Thank you so much. It's, it really is, um, it's just heartbreaking to reflect on uh, what we lost and what might've been from that 
time period. And, and so I really appreciate you bringing it right up to the present day. Um, so to our audience, uh, I'm going to start with a couple of my questions that I had um, come up with in advance. But if you want to ask a question, please um, put your question in the chat uh, or just let us know that you have a question and you want to unmute and ask. Um, I'm also going to just before I forget to do this, um, put, okay. So that link that I <clears throat> just put in is for the survey to let us know what you think of the event. So please do that. And then there's my email. Um, there are a lot of teachers here today and um, those teachers can receive a professional development certificate. So please email if you would like that. Um, and so that actually um, kind of segues into one of my big questions today, <clears throat> which is that public school teachers in New Jersey are required to fulfill two um, Department of Education mandates, which I think is a great thing that they do. It might not necessarily be like baked into the standards, but teachers are required to include Holocaust education in grades K to 12. That's been since uh, 1994. And then more recently to include the history of disabled and LGBT persons in grade six to 12. So I was wondering if you had advice to teachers who wanted to include, you know, your article or this topic in their middle and high school classrooms. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I just want all of you to know, I, I could say so much more. Um, I, I really pared back that um, <laughs> my presentation because I want to, I want to answer your questions. I want to be directed in how I tell you about the things that I've discovered and, and the work that I'm doing. Um, so this is a great question. Yes. So it, one of the things that's, uh, that's difficult about this history is that it's often quite depressing. Um, it's a very, very frustrating history. And I think it can, in some ways, almost lead us to feel hopeless. And that is the opposite of what I think I want people to take away from that. The article that I have uh, that I did for Scientific American is uh, is not meant to be depressing. I think that one is is actually quite interesting because it talks a lot more specifically about the wonderful things that were on offer and um, just how long ago we figured out how to do, for instance, uh, a full transition for for trans women, trans men. It took longer. Uh, the full transition wasn't available until after World War II, but astonishing scientific and medical achievements for care. So it is really, really powerful and impacting to know that. But I also would love it if um, if along the way, when you introduce the story, you introduce the story of Dora Richter. Uh, in the article, I did not yet know the complete history of Dora Richter. And Dora Richter was an amazing, amazing trans woman. She she was just sort of this unsinkable fi figure and, and very sweet and personable. And she had a very, very difficult life. But she wasn't famous. People tend to know who Lily Elba is. The movie came out um, a couple years ago about her. But people don't know about Dora because Dora was just an everyday person, a, a worker bee, a blue collar kind of person who was just working in the trades and trying to live her life as a trans woman. And she didn't know there were others. Like she lived very far, like kind of very rural. And so it takes her a long time before she finally discovers that this is even a possibility. And she is, in fact, the very first person to undergo sexual reassignment surgery. And her name's often forgotten. Well, for years, people thought that she got uh, that she died during the raid. But I have since sub subsequently realized that that's not true. She actually uh, lives well. Past, she she lives after World War II, and she gets a, an official name and gender change on her birth certificate and passport. And so it's really, really, uh, I think, important to introduce students to a story that doesn't end with the Nazis. That that shows that you know. This story does carry on. Hirschfeld himself becomes an exile. He trains other people in other countries. Uh, the Kinsey Institute is partly comes out of that, uh, which is still operating. And, you know, some of the first surgeries that were done here in the United States were done by people who had been students of Hirschfeld's. So if you think about it that way, this story carries on. It's a lot more like stories. Star Wars. <laughs> and our folks are the Rebel Alliance. And I actually did try to keep that in mind while I was writing the book. So if if I were a teacher, one of the things I think I would do is I would use a bit of pop culture to say, you know, these are the rebels fighting an evil empire. They are the ones who they, they lose to the empire in some ways, 
but they carry that message out, right? They get the Death Star plans out. And 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 so, you know, rights organizations crop up in the United States and, in, you know, in Canada and in various parts of Europe as a result of these things. So, you know, Hirschfeld, it's not as though the story ended when they burned the library. Um, many of the most important documents had already been smuggled out, some of them over the Alps into France. I mean, it's a really exciting story about how we can overcome and persevere, but it was almost always queer people helping other queer people. Um, and the allies that Hirschfeld had were uh, women's organizations a lot of times and the medical organizations and scientific organizations who had come to recognize the validity of the science that they were that they were seeing that says okay this isn't a choice someone someone is born this way or born a, a in, on a spectrum that is fluid and i think um sorry that's a long answer but i think just in, inspiring them with the hope that this isn't all bad news this is about how we win against you know seemingly insurmountable odds wow great lesson idea <laughs> honestly um, have you been a teacher before? Aside from uh, I was a professor for many years. Um, so mainly to, um, to college age students. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can, I can tell from that. Um, so first of all, I want to remind the audience again, you can ask questions too. I'm not trying to, um, be the only person asking questions, but I am very interested. Um, you know, you talked about the Nazis perversion of science through you know, mass murdering disabled people and Jews and so many different people, um, their medical experiments during the Holocaust. Um, so it seems that they really did understand uh, in some sick way, the importance of science in society. Um, mm -hmm. And it kind of starts me making some loose connections about how this compares toward the attitude, our attitudes towards science maybe not ours, but some attitudes in society towards science today. Yeah. It's uh, it's very interesting because I think um, we would be wrong to think that it wasn't intentional. They were intentionally skewing science in their favor. That was a true thing. Uh, in fact, the, you know, Hitler in Mein Kampf, which is a terrifying document, uh, he lays out how to change people's minds about things. I mean, it, it is about manipulating people and using the news and using other things to do that. Um, and uh, at which he was quite good. So he realized that you could focus on community health and hygiene, and you could get away with a lot under that terminology. And he liked a lot of times, and this is, ugh, you're going to, you're going to see the parallels. He talked a lot, he, him, the Nazis, about protecting the children, right? We're going to protect the children through science and hygiene, but they also used that as a way to villainize anyone they wanted. They they almost universally treated uh, homosexuals as though they were child predators, which you've heard this on the news, right? You've heard at actually sitting Congress people say these very things uh, recently at the CPAC. In fact, two of them said this. Um, and they they were using that rhetoric then too, realizing that if you that that so many people were okay with oh hygiene, cleanliness, community health, protecting children, that they kind of nodded along to those things, and then ugly things were sort of slipped in around the corners and underneath. And the other thing that I think is is easy to miss is how pervasive. Um, there's a wonderful quote which I, I is in the book that I found from a a woman, a German woman not a hateful person at all, but who kind of went along with the Nazis. And she said, well, they just, they were just everywhere. They were everywhere. So certainly it must be true. Um, and that because they had taken over all forms of the media, they were using newspapers, they were using radio, they were using uh, public forums, they, they plastered newsletters and flyers, everything everywhere. So if you think about it, they were very bent on taking a bit of information that had some stuff about it that was right, twisting it, and then making sure it was everywhere so that you could not escape it. And these are tactics we have seen in attacks against homosexuals and transgender people today. So the tactics have not actually changed very much. And it is important to realize this is frequently not, it preys upon ignorance, 
but those enacting these tactics were not ignorant of the science. They weren't even ignorant about how they were twisting it, usually. I mean, Steinek literally looked at real things and went, well, let's not pay attention to this half, but we'll pay attention to this half. Th this was common. The biased biases led. And I always tell people, science is not apolitical. Science is political because people are political. And so we have to be constantly on our guard. Thank you. You have a question in the chat. If you could possibly expand on or share, I'm going to mess this up because I don't speak German. What is known about Hirschfeld's transvestite right. the, yeah, yes, yes. Transvestite past um, and what that did for the trans community in Germany? Right. Yes, I would love to. So um, this is a really, really interesting question because when I said that Hirschfeld was supporting trans and, and gay rights, I didn't just mean uh, that surgeries were happening. And I think we we tend to, sometimes we can overly focus on that, but in fact, they were supporting people in a lot of different ways. So this transvestite pass, oh, it was almost like a passport or a kind of ID card. There was a time where um, you could be arrested and taken to prison for dressing in clothes of the opposite sex. More often, uh, usually it was uh, trans women were more often fell prey to this, but trans men also. And they would take you to prison. And of course, um, they would put you in prison. So if you were dressed as a woman and you're a man, they would take you to prison and they would put you in prison with other men. Like it was a really dangerous thing to have happen. This is not where you would want to be and, and violent, terrible things can happen. So this is, um, these passes were delivered, were constructed with the police and Hirschfeld and several other doctors. And what they proved where they were like, okay, these people are born this way and they can't, they actually um, can't help being this way. And therefore they should be able to have a pass because they're not intending to break the law and they should be allowed to dress this way. And so if they showed the card while well, they were out in public and if police were harassing them, the police were not allowed to arrest them if they had this pass. So the pass was basically a medical document saying um, you are legally allowed to dress in clothes of the opposite sex. But this gets really complicated because on one hand, it seemed almost as though it pathologized transgenderism a little bit because it was like saying uh, a medical doctor has decided you, you can't help it. And for a while, um, that was that was sort of touch and go. And, and Herschel had to deal with that, the, the complexities of trying to work within a broken legal system. So he came up with something even better. And I love this. He decided to expand the definition of what today we call intersex, they called hermaphrodism. And he decided to expand its definition to include emotional, mental, or psychic hermaphrodism, which meant he could basically say this person should be allowed to dress this way because they're actually both sexes. And he used this argument to help people get real name changes, like honest to goodness name changes, birth record changes and everything. He, do he does this for um, Lily Elba. He does this for Dora Richter. He does this for, for several other people. And as, and as a result, um, they were no, it, it went from being the past to being legitimized as name changes and birth record changes because he basically, he was like, okay, um, we'll just make the umbrella bigger for what this means. Because true people who were intersex at the time often could choose which gender they, once they got to an age of, of sort of discernment, I guess, they were allowed to choose which gender they wanted to operate as. And, um, and Hirschfeld usually encouraged them to choose the masculine gender because they he was like your you know your life will be better but but they didn't you know there were several people who were like i've discovered i'm intersex but i've lived as a woman and i want to stay a woman and um and that happened too but so the, these passes were delivered as a way of protecting people from prison but then they ultimately almost kind of have a second life as hirschfeld realizes he can expand definitions and help people actually get name changes and and birth record changes but i just think it's amazing <laughs> wow um okay there's some more questions in the chat um this one says oh yeah so I oh you see why them is right? it not taught in, yeah I do I do see them um says how come this isn't part of a history taught in school it seems like we're still hiding the subject matter uh there's so much that's not taught in in high schools I and mean, it's frustrating it is um I'm my part of my family is Native American and there's just a lot we don't get about that either I feel like some of this um really was very consciously erased. 
And that that remains um, up. I mean, a lot of it's still in German. So I've had to do, I, I ended up paying several translators. I mean, it, just getting this information together, I could tell you a really funny story about me trying to get some of these documents out of Berlin um, was very, very hard. And I think some of it is that it's a complex matter that not everybody wants to uh, address. And some of it is that I think the information is still hard to get to. So I'm excited about my book coming out because in addition to the fact that I'm telling this story, I provide a really, really comprehensive bibliography um, at the end. So hopefully we'll we'll move forward from there. I'm loving this next one here. Um, it says the born this way or born in the wrong body trope can be perceived as a version of biological determinism, much like Darwin's idea of fitness can be misapplied to human societies as social Darwinism. Right now in several countries, you have to be sterilized in order to transition. Yes, this in, in fact, uh, Japan just changed their laws so that you don't have to be sterilized. I didn't realize they still had that on the books. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, when Hirschfeld first started developing his ideas, he he went in the whole like born in the wrong body, born this way kind of direction. He's like, okay, you were born gay and you'll always be gay. You were born uh, transmasculine, and you'll always be transmasculine, etc. But as he developed his theories, he realized that there was so much more um, variety and flex in the way gender operates for people. Um, he actually came up with and. I can't remember, like, the number is so huge and massive that I always forget what it is, but he like came up with like 100,000 different varieties or variations on gender or something like that. Um, I've written it down in the book, but I've forgotten the exact number, but it was huge. Like he'd done the math and was like, look at how many genders there could be. And so um, even though at times he seems like he's really buying into the kind of biological determinism, he really, uh, he developed this term, the intermediaries. And unlike you know, it wasn't, this is a trans man. It wasn't, this is a trans woman. It wasn't, this is a gay person, a straight person. Intermediaries meant, uh, in his mind, a kind of hybrid that almost was like a all genders or only one gender. It's, it's kind of complicated depending on how he talked about it. it he, he himself was um, a, uh, a practitioner of uh, a particular kind of sort of sciencey faith that believed everything went back to a single cell. So it was almost kind of um, like true hermaphrodism or, or single sexness, but at the same time, this possibility that you could flex between. So it, I think that uh, his journey is kind of a journey we're still on, you know, in a way where you have people who really do feel very, very deeply that they were born in the wrong body. I'm non-binary myself, um, but by, I don't mean I have no gender. I kind of want all of them or <laughs> I want to flex between them, but people have different meanings. So for me, a, a specific intrinsic gender doesn't, doesn't matter very much, but for some people it does. And I think that the most important way to look at it is actually that spectrum kind of flex um, that, that Hirschfeld came up with so early on that that's because there's a lot of different ways to be. Oh, uh, does your book include Hirschfeld's connection with Harry Benjamin? It does, um, but all, that comes quite late. Uh, he, Harry Benjamin knew Hirschfeld. If you guys don't know who he is, he helped to introduce um, some of the early transition surgeries in the United States and was a really um, big, big proponent. He's actually the one who came up with, I believe, the transgender word as opposed to transvestite, which is what um, they were considered early on. But that was a, a later kind of connection in their lives. My book really ends kind of in 1933. Um, but Hirschfeld actually comes to America on, on his world tour at Harry Benjamin's invitation to New York. And that's one of the reasons why he's not killed by the Nazis, because he wasn't in Germany when, uh, when they basically put out uh, a hit on him, sort of, but he wasn't there anymore. Oh, transsexual. Okay, yeah, that's the one. Sorry, I'm reading the comments. <laughs> yeah, no, no, thank you. I, it's like real time. It's good. Um, and of course, people can continue to do that or you can raise your hand. There's that um, feature as well. There's just so much more I could say. I mean, one of the things that I think is is really, uh, this, the science is so strange. Like we did so many weird things early on trying to figure these things out. Like when they were trying to figure out genetics, they thought that, if you cut off a mouse's tail, it might give birth to tailless mice. 
And so like so many mice lost their tails in the search for whether or not this was true. And of course it wasn't, but I mean, it, there's just very, very weird stuff that goes on. And, you know, we think of today, uh, science seems so much more, um, you know, specific and we have rules about things that uh it was it was wild it was very mavericky and they performed a lot of these early um uh you know sexual transition surgeries were also risks uh, they were very risky and the patients were very brave in willing to go through and try these different experiments thank you um i have another question for you um so when we learned about this uh, destruction of the clinic and other Nazi activities, um, mm -hmm. we kind of see their ideals coming together that anti-Semitism, there's misogyny, there's ableism, gender roles, sexuality, I mean, it's like everything in this story. Um, I think you had commented that Magnus Hirschfeld became such an object of, of hate because he represented several of these um, categories. So I was wondering if you could comment on how those ideals kind of work together in this case and, and just generally not. Yeah. <laughs> um, this was not a, a feel good book to write. I'll tell you that. Um, it, so some of what I was trying to get at in the, in the slides and which is hard to address in a short space, but I'll, I'll do my best is that you had um, what you really started off with was change. Times were changing. Things were changing. And things changed really quickly. So the Industrial Revolution to now, it's it's astonishing how fast things have changed. And I don't think we always appreciate that. But up until the Industrial Re Revolution, change happened quite slowly. And so there was a lot of backlash to this idea of uh, to change. And one of the things that to me is most evident is that misogyny really, really got entrenched in the 19th century. Not that it was, it was always there. It's not like it's ever not been there, but misogyny, patriarchy, there was actually a little bit more freedom in some ways in the 18th century. There was a little bit more of a, a laissez-faire kind of, you know, people were stretching and, and trying new things. Um, Chevalier, uh, Chevalier Dion, who was an 18th century trans woman, um, quite famous and accepted as a, as a woman in France. Um, in the 18th century. And then the 19th century kind of was a backlash to that. And that is a little bit what um, becomes the seed of everything else that that moves ahead. I, I almost feel as though that that desire for a patriarchal past, an, a simpler time when, um, when men were in control more um, specifically, was something that people longed for because the because change frightened them, right? We had suddenly there was science and there was, you know, there was a, a lot less um religion had been very shaken up by a lot of the things that had happened in the end of the 19th century, going into the 20th century. People wanted to go backward. And misogyny really, really does seem to be at the heart of so much of this because it's like better is masculine. And they they took, um, you, you guys might have been noticing in the news, they've discovered recently that hunter-gatherer societies, a lot of the hunters were actually women. They knew that in the 19th century and they suppressed it. And literally uh, a gentleman rewrote a natural history kind of anthropological work saying, no, 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 uh, it was all men, 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 all the men. And that has basically they didn't, they knew, they really thought matrilineal and matriarchal cultures were important. And, and that was just completely obliterated in the 19th century uh, by a, a couple of people. Basically, it was like two people <laughs> and they just became the textbooks for everything. So it was a, a desire to not just, you know, keep women down, but almost like do worse, like push them beyond what they used to have to show that men were the ones who were in control. Why is a very complicated, there's lots of papers, whole books written about why this happened at the time period, but it is something that, that we know is true. It's just a huge fear of, of, of women and of feminine, uh, feminization. And then they connected that to ideas about degeneration because they were like, oh, if women are out there in the workforce, they're not going to be good moms. They're going to have, they literally used to think that your ovaries would shrivel up if you learned too much. I mean, so um, they they just had this concept that somehow keeping women as dumb vessels was the way to preserve society. And that 
is what the whole von der Vogel, which was the the sort of Boy Scout kind of thing in Germany, grew out of that, and Hans Bluhr's ideas grew out of that. They didn't start off being anti-Semitic and anti-homosexual, but it's like once you, when you first begin to hate, it becomes easier to hate other groups. And you can look at that now. Um, go to any of these, you know, go to an anti-trans rally, and who do you see there? There's skinheads there. There's, you know, anti-women groups there. There, it's like it's so. It's really interesting how hatred seems to collect hatred. And that is essentially that watching the the period of time from the early, it's like 1901 to even up to, to 1933, just watching the way that ball was rolling and picking up more people to hate as it went, more people on the outside, you know, this little, little club on the inside. And it's just, um, I feel like we're watching it happen again. So this book was very frustrating to write because I felt as though, I would turn on the news and then I would go do my research and I would turn on the news. And I'm like, these two things are the same. It's like, oh, it's upsetting. Yeah. If you go to the last um, comment in the chat, which I can, um, which I can read and then we can, just because it connects so well to what you were um, just saying. Um, so it says, thanks for a very insightful talk and to think historically about all forms of othering. Could you say something from your own work and tie it to the kind of language that we are increasingly hearing in public discourse in the USA and around the world, calling human beings vermin and animals mm -hmm. and how it demonizes a population in order to commit unspeakable acts against them? We all need to be vigilant. Yes. Um, when I first pitched this book, because you pitch a book long before you actually like get around to writing and completing it, it was almost less relevant than it is now. It seems as though we are in the midst of another situation where change and fear um, and instability is leading to a similar situation where people are looking for scapegoats. And so um, I mentioned earlier that they, at the time, were saying we need to protect the children. And they were using that rhetoric to say uh, gay people are predators. And as predators, they don't deserve to be treated as regular human beings, right? So there was this concept that if you call them a pedophile, that's such uh, an alarming knee-jerk reaction kind of thing that someone who preys upon children, that it immediately becomes easier to, to hate. And so at the CPAC this year, Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, she said that homosexuals so homosexuals are predators that are you know that trans people are predators that drag night at the story hour or whatever that these are predators and they're pedophiles and i actually was interviewed um by uh well i forget which as a major news outlet about this and i talked about it and i literally got attacked by marjorie taylor green's people online shortly after that so i mean they're watching even right now like You'll probably hear stuff now because I'm talking about it right here. But it's like they immediately want to attack anybody who, it, who, if they don't want anyone to listen to you, they can call you a predator. And then I just saw in the chat here, someone says they're calling librarians predators now for wanting them to be able to read books, right? That, that some people want banned. Predator of children is one of those categories. Like that's no longer, that's no longer a person we need to think about. But about animals and vermin and things like that, this is how they were talking about uh, Jewish people. It's also how they were talking about disabled people um, and Romani people. And so one of the things that really struck me as interesting was they took away the autonomy of people who had disabilities, not mental disabilities. I mean, physical disability. You had a physical disability and they would take your autonomy away and say, well, you're no longer enough of a person to make your own decisions. And that meant if you were epileptic, if, if you were, I'm also autistic, by the way, um, if you were autistic and, you know, sometimes people will call autism Asperger's because Asperger was a Nazi who decided which autistic people they should send to the gas chamber and which were like trainable. Um, and I don't mean trainable as in intelligent. I mean, trainable as in they'll do what we tell them to do kind of thing. So it, it just shows you how easy they pick certain words, certain kinds of rhetoric, child predator, uh, monster, um, a lot of ableist terms, idiot, uh, you know, I, I, I don't use these terms because they're bad. So I can't even, I can't even call them into my mind, but you know what I'm, I'm saying? And then they went with more animalistic 
kinds of things. Like they're not full humans, right? They treated the Jews as though they were not full humans. They talked about them as though they were not full humans. They, uh, on the great chain of being, because they would put Aryans on top, they had Jews under all other races of human being. Um, this was in a German textbook. So it just goes to show you it deranged. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Like they would say, you know, these people are there for, they're not people anymore. They're diseases, they're animals, they're vermin, they're predators, they're, you know, they are the reason things are bad, right? Things were bad in Germany because World War I left them completely catastrophically economically broke. Um, but it was much easier to be like, it's because of these people. And if we just get rid of those people, not because we as a government made terrible ideas, <laughs> made terrible decisions, or because we were at a great big war, or no, it's it's those people. They've taken your stuff. And there is nothing more powerful than someone coming up to you when things are bad and going, this isn't your fault. This is their fault. And we're going to get them for you. It sold like hotcakes, didn't it? You know, people really, they ate that up. And now you're seeing it again. So um, librarians who are trying to allow kids to read banned books are child predators. Uh, you're dressed in drag and reading, at, you know, a happy little rainbow book and you're a predator. Or um, during COVID, I have many friends who are disabled and therefore on ventilators. And you had people actually saying like, well, they're not even whole people. Look, they're disabled. We should take their ventilators for the healthy people who have COVID was an actual argument that was actually made to some of my friends. Um, this concept that somehow you're not, your life isn't worth living. Well, where have we heard that before? Lives worth living. That was the entire eugenics campaign uh, that Hitler used. Um, what was it? T the, the, no, I'm forgetting my own history here. I have been so steeped in this history. You think I wouldn't forget any of it, but the, the mandate that he did that first went after disabled people and then that they used against uh, Jewish people. And a T4 program. Thank you. <laughs> Like you guys have got my back. I love it. Um, but but the the other thing that's really interesting is how people changed, right? I told you Hans Bluer started off being a friend of Hirschfeld's. Hirschfeld wrote the introduction to Hans Bluer's first book. And then he turned against Hirschfeld. And, you know, there were other people who were friends with Hirschfeld who even like tried to turn him into the Nazis. And it, it's it's astonishing to see that. Probably the most um this one's hard for me. It's really hard for me. The surgeons who performed the sexual transition surgeries for uh, for Lily Elba and also for Dora Richter and a couple others, there were several different surgeons and the surgeries happened in, um, there were like four different surgeries and you went in stages. But the person who performed the final, the sort of uh, very technical stuff, vaginoplasty, which was plastic surgery, et cetera, was uh, a doctor named Gorbrandt. And he was working with Hirschfeld and the Institute. And he eventually joins the Nazis and works at a clinic that is studying hypothermia by force drowning Jewish men in icy water. And I thought, how how can you have been fighting for the rebel alliance and you know, and then deciding to you know, and he published a paper about hypothermia, which was on one hand, yes, very useful and helped the science move forward, but he did it because he had been part of experiments that killed and abused uh, Jewish people at a camp. And that is something he actually never was held accountable for, which just astonishes me. Uh, and so when I first wrote the article um, for Scientific American, they came back and they were like, well, isn't this guy famous? Like, you can't just say he's a Nazi. And I was like, here are the receipts. <laughs> um, I can. And, and it is, it's just um, amazing to me that you can be part of the solution and then turn around and become part of the problem. And yet we probably all have family members or friends that we've lost over the course of the last few years as divisions have gotten deeper. So I think um, what didn't seem possible is starting to seem like, okay, I, I see how this happens. That is horrible, but true. Um, we're kind of running out of time. So I would just like to leave it to you if you have some concluding thoughts for this wonderful event. Oh my. Um, are there any last questions that any of you want to ask me? Um, 
the the book is finished. It's it's with my editors and will come out in 2024 at some point. I don't know exactly when, but uh, if you follow me in any way, I, I'm happy to keep you updated. Um, please type any last questions you have, but otherwise, I guess I would say not to lose hope. Uh, the Star Wars analogy has really gotten me through a lot through this project because it is good to remember that we still have each other's back. We still do. Women still helping women, minorities still helping other minorities, you know, gay and trans people, the autistic community, the disability community. We are, we're the rebel alliance. We're the ones. And we're doing our best to fight for a better future. And I believe that that better future is coming. Oh, there is one more question here. In your research, did you discover any individuals with similar stories or experiences like Lydia Barcroft when the Nazis were in power? Um, I didn't, but that's partly because, again, uh, my research ended in 1933. So most of the work I do is about how we get to the point where the Nazis uh, come into power. And so I didn't uh, I didn't go much further than that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone for coming today. It was a great conversation. And I, I think it's a conversation that will start many other conversations, which is- um, I just I just wanted to say it was really, really lovely to, to be here with all of you. And I really appreciate talking to you. I feel like I could talk about this for hours and there's so much more that I would say that I could say, um, but uh, just thank you for listening. Thank you for being here because you realize you, you are the- you are the reason things don't have to go the way they did. You're the reason that we have change. And uh, so thank you, because you're the reason we have a chance to look at a better future. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming today. <laughs>